All right, thanks. Uh, Jim, of course, has provided a, a very nice uh, expected overview of substorms at Mercury. Uh, of course, we know that substorms uh, occur at Earth. I've known that for a very long time. Uh, represented very clearly by this uh, iconic figure, uh, Bob, Bob McFerrin, uh, made in 1973, so it's even older than the Yosemite uh, meeting. Now, the important part of the substorm current wedge is that it transmits the stress that occurs in this dipolarization region to the ionosphere and transmits the stresses that the ionosphere wants to impose on the magnetosphere back. So it's a really nice example of MI coupling um, at Earth, uh, but it's a quasi-static picture. And as we go to Mercury, we're going to find this quasi-static picture doesn't really ap apply. So a little bit more detail on the from current wedge if you're not uh, familiar with it. Uh, again, this is the original picture. We have here are the current lines, lines of current. Uh, these are the tail uh, sheet current. These are field line currents going into the ionosphere on the eastern edge, out of the ionosphere on the western edge. And the original picture was described as a short circuit of the cross-tail current. Uh, there was a region of dipolarized magnetic field that is less stretched field. So as the current came across, it couldn't flow uh, across the dipolarized region, was diverted into the ionosphere, across and back out. I'll talk about that um, description in a minute. I don't like that description because it treats it as currents, uh, like wires doesn't really tell you why uh, things are flowing. Now, dipolarization in this region um, occurs because these fast flows from the reconnection site come in, carrying magnetic flux. Um, they slow down very rapidly as they approach the Earth, uh, and that flux then piles up, creates a partially dipolarized magnetic field. Uh, we call these flows, of course, uh, burst bulk flows or fast flows. Theorists call them low entropy bubbles. Uh, they're exactly the same thing, just a different description uh, if you're a theorist or an observationalist. And you can see why uh, dipolarization happens when you look edge on at the, at the pressure distribution. Uh, here's the Earth and here's Mercury uh, showing the dipole field at this equatorial surface, about 65,000 nanotesla. And if you go out to the reconnection region, the field's only about nanotesla. It's a very strong increase in magnetic pressure going from the reconnection site to Earth. And a flow that starts out here in a relatively low pressure region comes in and rapidly reaches a region of high magnetic pressure that it can't overcome. That region tends to occur somewhere around geosynchronous. For Themis, it's a little bit further out, 8 to 10 RE. But in that region of where the field's about 80 nanotesla is where dipolarization typically occurs, and the flow rapidly uh, breaks. If you go to Mercury now and sort of take the same factor of 64 increase of magnetic pressure from the X-line to the breaking region, uh, you find that the breaking region is actually very close to the planet's surface. And that's because this equatorial field strength in Mercury is only 300 nanotesla. Any amount of stretching is going to even weaken that field. So a flow that starts out, out here basically impacts the planet's surface. Um, so that's where the flow breaking uh, is more or less occurring. The other point I want to make here is that with a field of 300 nanotesla, the alphane speed doesn't increase nearly as rapidly as it does at Earth. At Earth, in this region, the alphane speed can be many thousands of kilometers per second. So there's time for that alphane wave to go down to the ionosphere and come back out. Uh, here, the alphane speed doesn't do that. The alphane speed is actually fairly slow compared to the size of the uh, mercury cavity. Now, it really got me interested in um, subterranean current wedge and mercury were these observations of dipolarization events. And dipolarization is uh, intimately tied to the subterranean current wedge. In fact, you can't really have a subterranean current wedge without dipolarization. Uh, here I've plotted two examples of dipolarization events. One's from Messenger at Mercury, one's from Goes at Earth. I've removed the labels so that would give the answer away. Uh, these are both BZ, vertical component, equatorial um, region. So comparing apples and apples, basically. So in your head, hopefully you've picked which one you think is which. Uh, the top is Messenger. And you notice that even though they look the same, without the labels. As soon as you put the labels on, you can see immediately two very uh, distinct differences. One, of course, is the time scale. At Messenger, uh, you see this rapid increase, this dipolarization. This goes from a stretched low BZ to a high BZ in about two seconds. And then it decays maybe five, seven seconds later, and then it'll be another dipolarization later. Here at Earth, you can see that this dipolarization occurs over maybe 20 minutes. Of course, over that 20 minutes, we're seeing all sorts of PI2 pulsations uh, as well. And then the decay takes quite a while, maybe two hours or so. 
The other thing that is different is the amplitude. A messenger, uh, you start with a 5 nanotesla stretch field, it rises up to 40, 50 nanotesla, that's a 10, factor of 10 increase in the field strength, and then rapidly goes down. At Earth, it's a much smaller increase. And we see that with all aspects of mercury dynamics. FTEs are much larger, um, comparatively, and, and um, plasmoids and flux and so on. All right, so what is the substrate from current waves? The fact that we have dipolarization at mercury implies that there must be some sort of currents at the edges of the dipolarized region, at least uh, in the quasi-static sense. So the substrate from current waves is generically is the diversion of cross-tail current into the ionosphere. As I mentioned earlier, it's because there's a dipolarized region here with a, or a disruption of the cross-tail uh, current, and that current then flows into the ionosphere, and that's the original description. Um, it's important to point out that on either side of this dipolarized region, the tail remains stretched. So it's a localized, azimuthally limited region of dipolarized field, and that's what gives rise to these field line currents. Uh, it's also useful to think, and my preference is to think of it as a new current system, superimposed on the tail current system. So in that case, you have a closed current loop flowing across the tail, canceling out this cross-tail current loop, going into the ionosphere across and back out. And that's a localized current loop that you can then look at from a, a fundamental physics uh, standpoint. And I think it was Ian Axford in one of the videos we saw on Monday who said, currents aren't given by God, they're given by the curl of B. And the curl of B, at least for the subsum current wedge, is given by stresses that are generated within or at the boundaries of this dipolarized region. So to understand the currents, you have to understand the stresses that are imposed on the system. And then curl of B just gives you what the current should be to, um, to match the, the boundary conditions. So here is a more up-to-date picture of the subsum current wedge. It's by Joachim Byrne. And what he's done is taken his MHD simulations, which have been very helpful in uh, looking at these, uh, the system, and broken it apart into individual elements, which we can then examine to see what is driving the substrum current wedge. Uh, every time Joachim draws this, he adds a new current loop. His newest paper has a fifth current loop here. Um, he goes crazy with his current loops, but this is a very nice picture because it allows us to look and see what's happening. So even though it looks complicated, it's actually very simple. And I'm a J cross B person. That's how I tend to understand what's happening. Joachim likes to talk in terms of Faraday's law, which I can't quite follow. But J cross B I find easy. So if you ignore all the loops except loop four, that's the easiest one to understand. Loop 4 surrounds the dipolarized region. So that's a region of high pressure. J cross B, B is, is out of the plane in, in all locations, uh, at least in the equatorial plane. J cross B then is radially outward from all points within that high pressure region. So that's just a J cross B force associated with the expansion of the dipolarized region. That's pretty easy to understand. Uh, loop 2 is actually the MI coupling uh, segment. Here, J cross B in the equator is inward. So that J cross B here is trying to constrain the high pressure region. In fact, you can see it's oppositely directed to this loop. So if it's strong enough, it actually cancels the azimuthal expansion. That's an indication that the ionosphere then is driving enough current to cancel the azimuthal expansion is constraining or containing that high pressure region. Now in the ionosphere, J cross B points outward, and that represents the magnetosphere trying to push the ionosphere around to the flanks. Loop 1 is the traditional subsum current wedge. Loop 3 I'm not going to really talk about. That shows up in the simulation as off equatorial pressure gradients and associated with the kink. So in the ionosphere, this is the traditional representation of the ionospheric portion of the subsum current wedge. In at the east, across as a westward electric jet, and out at the west. This is an integrated representation of all currents as seen by low latitude uh, magnetometers. This is now our updated picture of what we think is happening. Uh, there are a lot of question marks here. I make it look like we know what this is, but there are some question marks. And this is, um, comes from work by Olaf Ahm, uh, Fuji, Gerloff, Hoffman, and others, uh, synthesizing what we, we think we know. Uh, the downward current region we think is more diffuse than the upward current region. There is some what we call remote closure. That's from a distant location. But there's significant local closure. So the upward field line current is mostly fed by local currents. There's a region zero current system at the poleward edge of the auroral uh, bulge. That's been confirmed. Markland has some nice papers on that. And there's a region two current system at the uh, equatorward edge. Uh, from event to event, the exact closure changes, the exact intensity changes. But this overall picture just gives you an indication of the kinds of currents that could be flowing during a subsum current wedge event. Of course, mercury has no ionosphere. So how does this all fit into the picture of mercury? 
Um, as I mentioned, this is a quasi-static picture, but at Mercury, we really need to look at a uh, time-dependent picture because things happen so rapidly. You can understand what happens by imagining uh, an initial unperturbed field line here in green. The flow takes it, moves it as smoothly, and introduces a kink. And that kink then will travel to the ionosphere as an alphane wave. And what happens next depends, of course, on the ratio of the alphanic conductance to the Pedersen conductance. And there are two limits. Here R, if it's minus 1, highly conducting, the ionosphere opposes the motion and builds up the current. And that's what happens at Earth. And that's what drives the mid-latitude PI2 pulsations. And Nishida and Glasmeyer have talked about that quite a bit. Here's the formula that gives you the buildup in the current. So the, this is the initial alphane current, uh, current associated with that initial alphane wave. Every reflection then builds up this current. You have a non-conducting ionosphere like in Mercury, the ionosphere moves freely. It doesn't just ignore the current, but actually sends an alphane wave that cancels that current. It tells the magnetosphere, I don't need that current, you can, you can keep it. But important for Mercury, um, it turns out, is that as the equatorial portion of that field line uh, reaches the equilibrium, equilibrium position before that alpha wave even comes back, that alpha wave is not even needed. So it may turn out that for Mercury, it doesn't even matter that it has an ionosphere or not. It depends on the time scales. So let's look at the time scales really uh, quickly here, because this is really the key to understanding what's happening in Mercury. Uh, these show the time scales of different substorm um, events. At top are the uh, Earth in minutes, bottom Mercury in seconds. I've normalized the length of the recovery, so the length of the recovery at Earth is about two hours, roughly. Uh, in Mercury, the recovery is about 10 seconds, highly variable. When I pick 10 seconds, I see the growth phase is uh, 30 minutes at uh, Earth and maybe two and a half seconds at Mercury, expansion in a similar time scale. The real differences, though, arise when you look at the alphane transit times. If you look at the alphane transit time of an alphane wave from the reconnection site to the ionosphere at Earth, it's a few minutes. It's much shorter than the length of the growth phase or the expansion phase, which means the ionosphere has time to communicate with the X-line, communicate with the mid-tail region. At Mercury, that doesn't happen. Here at Mercury, the, the, reconnection, the time from the reconnection site to the ionosphere is 10 seconds. And that's the uh, length of the recovery phase, length of the expansion and growth phase. So basically, if, even if there were an ionosphere, there wouldn't be any time for that ionosphere to communicate to the mid-tail region. Same thing from the dipolarization to the ionosphere. Even though dipolarization occurs close to Mercury's surface, the alpha speed doesn't really increase that much, so that if there were an ionosphere, it couldn't even reach that dipolarization to communicate. All right, so next to the last slide. So what is the role of the ionosphere at Earth? Well, it likely controls the rate of decay of the substrum current wedge. You see that with uh, PI2 pulsations that build up the current, that current then slowly decays. So the ionosphere is clearly playing a role there, but the drivers of the currents are established by the flows themselves. The magnetosphere establishes the stresses in the magnetosphere that drives the currents. And the ionosphere doesn't cooperate with that. If it doesn't move plasma to the day side, it really doesn't much matter, because what happens is the magnetosphere will then just go around uh, that high pressure region. So in this sense, the ionosphere is kind of a nuisance. Um, but, but it's there. It's, it's, it's participating in happening. For mercury, the dipolarization occurs and decays on one or two alphane time scales. That means that the process is over. This high-pressure dipolarization region has smeared out before the ionosphere could even respond. So it's a bit unfortunate, I think, that things are like that because we don't actually get a natural experiment that I was hoping to see of what happens when you get dipolarization without an ionosphere because I don't think it actually matters because things are happening so fast. So in conclusion, if it comes up. Um, so the Earth-Mercury system is really a natural laboratory for studying um, the ionospheric influence on magnetospheric dynamics. It should be going backwards here in a second. Um, maybe, there it is. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm just going to wait a second. So terrestrial substorms contain all the loops of the uh, substorm current wedge. There it is. Um, Mercury probably only contains loop four. That's all it can, and that constrains the, um, the high pressure region. Um, really means is that Hermian dynamics are locally self-controlled and self-regulated by magnetospheric pressure gradients. Because the time scales are such that there's really just no time to communicate any of these stresses to the ionosphere and back. So any process that occurs, the growth phase, dipolarization, FTEs, and so on, are self-regulated by what's happening in that localized region. And a larger question that I think came up after Jim's talk is why do substrums exist at all at Mercury? Uh, without line tying, without ionospheric trying to slow things down, what inhibits convection? Why can't 
uh, Mercury just enter a steady magnetic zero convection state and just can't keep going. And again, I think the question is that the loading is much faster than communication to the ionosphere. As soon as that FDE comes down to the mid-tail region, you stretch within a few seconds, hit reconnection, and you get a flow burst. It's just so rapid, there's no time to even communicate with the ionosphere. Thank you. Um, so the uh, periodic substorms that uh, Jim Slavin talked about, is, is that a, a common, more typical mode? Um, and the reason I'm asking is, you know, at Earth, as you know, um, global simulations indicate that the periodic substorms are due to mass loading in the, in the plasma sheet, ionospheric outflows. And I'm wondering if, in answer to your last question here, uh, that, that the uh, outflows are intimately connected with, with the uh, reconnection process. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm answer for Jim, I'm not sure we, we know. I think Jim has seen uh, periods where you don't see periodic substorms, periods where you do, and periods when you see SMC-like events. So I don't think there's a clear answer to that. Okay. If, uh, is that possible you don't have an ionosphere, but uh, your RFN conductivity become large? So the reflection still uh, going on, you still can cause aurora there. Well, I, I don't think there's evidence of aurora. But, uh, I just want to follow on from um, Bill Lotko's question. I'm wondering if, there's, if we're getting a little sort of worrying too much about the outflows in Mercury's case. In that at the Earth, we also know that flux transfer events have a recurrence time of a few minutes. Is it possible that the solar wind interaction at Mercury, the, you know, the interaction at Mercury is essentially just flux transfer event type of interactions, and that period, that interaction imposes a periodicity for the for the recycling time? Yeah, I think that's that's probably a, a good point. Yeah. Hey. Sir, at, at Earth, you have, of course, an eight-minute, uh, the canonical repeat time for FTEs is eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, eight minutes does not closely correspond with any particular magnetospheric um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, sp uh, spike in time space. Uh, but that makes sense, because at Earth, we study the FTEs because of what it tells us about reconnection, because it's basic plasma physics. But if FTEs quit occurring tomorrow, the Earth's magnetosphere, for all, as nearly as we can tell, wouldn't care. Uh, they're not significant in terms of energy. There would be some uh, vortices disappearing in the incoherent scatter radar uh, scans, uh, but that appears to, to be all. But in this case, uh, we are seeing eight seconds, 10 seconds uh, for the FTEs, and then we're often seeing eight seconds, 10 second repeat times for the uh, dipolarizations and also for the uh, uh, plasmoid releases. Just a, a quick final uh, quick point. I mean, We've done a lot of work on what starts reconnection, but comparatively little work on what stops reconnection. And that's really important for determining these timescales. Okay. Thank you very much again for stimulating talk. <laughs>